If you're watching the schedule and you are confused, you are not alone. We did not visually really represent. Matt will not be speaking for an hour. He's going to be speaking for half an hour. So he's pleased. This is Matt's first time speaking, so I'd like to uh, thank Matt for making this, this inaugural event. Uh, he claims to have dabbled in many things, such as uh, cryptocurrency and <laughs> Uh, other things. He really hates paper voting. Um, there's a lot I pick up from his Twitter feed. Actually, I think Matt's greatest skill is sacrificing himself on the altar of Twitter trolls so that others may live. Um, if, if you follow him on Twitter, he does a masterful job of managing the trolls. Uh, Matt is actually an unbelievably smart person. Um, he has uh, uh, you know, been a leader in this industry for oh, academia. I don't know if you're okay be calling part of the industry or not, but good enough. Um, he, uh, he's done a lot to advance the state of the systems that we use every day in society and in our companies uh, to make them more secure. So it's actually an honor to have Matt on stage, not just once, but twice uh, this, this weekend, which is fantastic. Wait, so what? yeah, right. <laughs> we, we, we put you up on stage a second time. Surprise! It's the other Matt Blaze. Uh, anyway, uh, so without further ado, let's welcome Matt to the stage. Thanks for that uh, generous introduction. Um, so this is a talk that's mostly going to be a, a, a retrospective about what's changed since the talk I gave in uh, some work I, I did in 2011 with uh, Sandy Clark, uh, Travis Goodspeed, and um, a couple of really bright uh, undergraduates um, at, at Penn, where we were looking at um, the usability of uh, and the protocols used outside the internet that interact with cryptography, so sort of non-internet cryptography. And I, you know, it, almost everything we do ultimately can trace itself back to my two favorite writings on um, the use of cryptography in practice. These are the two great classic papers that we have proven again and again um, we haven't learned uh, nearly enough from. Uh, the first was a paper from 1993 by Ross Anderson called Why Crypto Systems Fail. Uh, it was presented at the first ACM CCS conference. And it basically described, you know, nothing about cryptanalysis um, and a lot about um, bad usability um, and, uh, you know, bad uh, conceptual frameworks that the cryptography is put in from the user's point of view. And the second is a, a paper by Alma Witten uh, that was called Why Johnny Can't Encrypt. Um, and it basically described the trash fire um, that was PGP and some lessons about designing um, crypto systems to be usable in practice that we have learned an amazingly small amount uh, from in practice. We don't make exactly the same mistakes uh, as we made before. We, we dress them differently. But we're still kind of making some fundamental mistakes of connecting security purposes to actual security. And, you know, I gave a, uh, a talk where I was asked to describe why does cryptography fail, you know, today in the 21st century. And I could kind of identify, you know, occasionally uh, we make mistakes with algorithms and protocols, um, not as often as we used to, um, and probably it's a decreasing problem in practice. Um, you know, often we make engineering and implementation mistakes. We have bugs and, and, and things like that in our, our systems. Um, but, you know, sometimes we, you know, we at least know how to correct those things. Um, we almost always, when we fail, um, have difficulty at the systems layer and the application layer, where what we, the security thing we want to do doesn't actually match what we've implemented in some way. And then finally, there's what we almost always do when there's a failure. There's some usability problem at work somewhere um, in uh, the system. And again, um, that's, that's an almost constant, even among systems that we argue hasn't failed we just blame the user for misusing them. So I'm going to describe an, you know, what's an example of a failure and kind of what we've learned in the seven and a half years uh, since uh, uh, Sandy and Travis and I uh, uh, did this work. And that's um, problems in a 
particular protocol and system called the APCO Project 25 two-way radio system. And this is a, a standard um, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, it, Russia is probably the dominant non-U.S. Uh, user of the system for two-way um, uh, radio, digital two-way radio. And it's um, a very heavily consta uh, constrained standard because it has to be kind of backwards compatible with the spectrum allocation used for non-digital two-way radio. So things have to fit into the same kind of channel, 12 and a half kilohertz wide channel. Uh, the modulation techniques have to be compatible with that. Uh, the uh, vocoder needs to be a, of a bandwidth that's uh, sufficient to fit into that. And the communications model has to be basically similar to um, other kinds of two-way radio. And the interesting thing about two-way radio is that two-way radio is not actually two-way in the sense of protocol design, right? When we design a protocol, um, we, you know, do things like send out a SYN and a NAC and a SYNAC, and we have this negotiation that happens. Um, but in fact, two-way radio, even if it's between two individual users, is overwhelmingly actually just two people who happen to be broadcasting and receiving each other. And the observation you might make is that that is, all, that is not how almost all of our security protocols that we know how to deal with work, right? Almost all of the security protocols have some sort of negotiation process uh, in them uh, between the uh, uh, two communicating parties, and we usually assume it's two communicating parties. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what we kind of know how to do. Um, and the one exception to that is email, right, where you're sort of broadcasting your email out to its recipient and kind of hoping that you've done whatever the right thing is. And we all know how successful email encryption has been. Um, so this is uh, roughly as successful as a security protocol um, as uh, encrypted email uh, has been. Um, so, uh, which is to say it is possible to get it right sometimes but we get it wrong or don't use it at all um, far more often than anything else. So we did a deep dive into this protocol, and I'm going to, you know, if you're interested in it, go read our paper from 2011, and there's been other work that's been done on that. I'm not going to bore you with all the details. I'm just going to go through this kind of very quickly to give you a flavor of what this looks like. So it uses a narrow band uh, radio channel, uh, 12 and a half kilohertz wide. It has to coexist with analog FM. It uses a 9600 uh, kilobit uh, uh, per second uh, in, in encoding. Um, it, the, the symbols are, are two bits and it's 4,800 symbols per second. So it's a pretty efficient vocoder. Um, it actually has um, surprisingly good speech quality, but it really wants to be implemented in, in hardware um, for, the, for the vocoder. And essentially the um, communication is break, broken down into 180 millisecond long um, uh, spurts of audio that are uh, put together into a, a big frame. Um, and there are uh, these frames of audio are, you know, kind of preceded by a header that says, hey, this is a voice frame and uh, what follows is either encrypted or it's not encrypted and then there's some error correction error correcting codes built on that header, um, and then there's the voice, uh, encoded voice, which is most of it, uh, and then a, uh, a, a, you know, an end of frame, and that's immediately followed by the next frame. And the reason it's framed um, uh, in 180 millisecond snippets, which if you do the arithmetic is 1728 bits, uh, is that you might not, you're not guaranteed to get the beginning of a transmission because radio is flaky and unreliable and, you know, you sometimes get noise bursts and so on. So this means you'll, you'll pick up in 180 milliseconds uh, if, if you've uh, lost something. Um, and again, it's a broadcast model in that uh, the, uh, there's no negotiation between sender and receiver. Uh, the receiver who's listening on the right channel and has the right key material, if it's encrypted, um, will receive it and otherwise won't. Um, 
and you don't really find out if they've gotten your voice traffic. There's also a messaging protocol on top of it, but it's mostly used to break uh, other things because it's used for rekeying, and um, uh, that, that turns out to be a big mess. So we looked at this protocol, um, and that was, that was complicated because getting a copy of a standard is really hard in this space. There's no IETF that you can just download it from, so we had to actually go to a, a library in Singapore and get it by interlibrary loan uh, to avoid having to pay several thousand dollars to get a look at the standard. Um, and I'm not going to say that there might have been any copyright infringement going on in our lab um, over that um, uh, after we got it. But um, the, the Singapore library was glad to send it to us through the, the UPenn library. And we found, like, as soon as we opened the standards, uh, you know, amazing protocol weaknesses that we could kind of identify um, right off the um, bat. First of all, uh, it doesn't authenticate really anything. Um, and so, uh, you know, one property of that is that even if things are encrypted, they're vulnerable to replay attacks um, um, kind of uh, right off of the bat. And on top of that, there is an over-the-air rekeying protocol um, which uh, lets you change the keys of individual handsets um, that is also vulnerable in all sorts of profoundly interesting uh, ways. Uh, one of the ways it's vulnerable is that it's not synchronous with the other radios. So once you start rekeying, it erases old keys and replaces them with new ones. And if users want to rekey, want to communicate with each other when one of them has been rekeyed and the others haven't, they have to switch to the clear. Um, and it takes a long time to rekey everyone because it's going over the same slow 9600 kilobit channel. Um, and um, uh, often the amount of time it takes to rekey is roughly the rekeying interval, and so it's kind of guaranteed to never work. Um, <laughs> So um, we also discovered things like metadata is unencrypted, and that led to some interesting attacks. You can build a marauder's map of the uh, units because they also have GPS built into them, uh, even if it's encrypted, and you can find out where all the FBI surveillance units are in your, in your neighborhood just by kind of listening to when, where they tell you they are. Um, so, um, uh, so that... That, that, was, that was kind of fun. We also discovered that there were um, implementation errors. There were some things that were supposed to be encrypted according to the standards that none of the actual vendors actually implement. And because they have to be inoperable, interoperable with each other, they choose to do what everybody else does rather than what the standard actually says. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of fun with, um, you know, discovering kind of what computer science academics look at. And you know, he said, "Oh, look! Here's a protocol failure. Here, here's what you did wrong here." And we thought, "Okay, we can we can write a uh, a paper about this." Um, my favorite of the clever attacks that we found was an efficient uh, active jamming attack uh, that took advantage of the way things are framed. Essentially, if you uh, jam the second 64 bits of a frame, you jam the in, um, information required to. Um, make any sense out of the rest of the 1,728 bits of the frame. Uh, and so what that means is that you can, uh, you can jam with an efficiency of, you know, an energy efficiency integrated over time of 14 decibels less than the legitimate users of the system, which is a pretty impressively bad amount of jamming resistance. Normally with things like spread spectrum uh, encoding, you get a you know, 20 dB or more advantage over the uh, jammer, but here you get this, uh, uh, you're actually disadvantaged if you're trying to use it to communicate and advantaged if you're trying to prevent someone from communicating. So that was kind of fun. And then we, we thought, well, you know, what could somebody actually do with this in practice other than prevent communication? And we realized that preventing communication is much less interesting than forcing people to be able to, to, to go into the clear. So we, we came up with this idea of, uh, which we thought was original, and it turned out not to be, of selective jamming. And the idea was to wait until you get the uh, metadata in a frame that says, oh, this is encrypted. And if you see that it's encrypted, wait for the next frame, 180 milliseconds later, and subsequent frames you jam in this highly efficient way. But if it says it's clear, you leave it alone. And uh, the idea is to train the users that the encryption doesn't work. Um, <laughs> And, um, 
you know, that, that requires a lot of fancy synchronization because you have to um, you have kind of a logic analyzer sort of uh, over the air looking at the transmission that's coming in, analyze the signal, uh, decode the subframes and so on. And, you know, if you try to do this um, in, in kind of the right way, you'd be going to like Rody and Schwartz and Hewlett Packard and so on and uh, Ag Agilent and so on. And, places that make protocol analyzers for radio and you'd be spending like hundreds of thousands of dollars on this stuff. So we kind of said, well, we're a university, we can't really afford that. And then Travis said, um, hold my beer. Um, and uh, um, he uh, came up with the, um, my first uh, jammer. So it turned out that this little uh, um, IME device um, was able to uh, decode individual parts of the subframe and also conveniently had a transmitter built into it that if you hook up a little external amplifier to it, it, it would do this. We did not use this outside the lab, I should point out. We never actually jammed anybody's transmission, but we did find you know, a kind of proof of concept that if you are a subject of surveillance and you want to stop the uh, you know, um, surveilling agency from sending encrypted transmissions uh, to you, uh, you can do this uh, for $29 for a two-pack uh, uh, of, of, of these little devices and kind of throw them around near all the receiver sites would be the way to kind of do it. And the battery will last about two weeks, which is enough for your uh, caper. We didn't do this, I should point out, and none of us, as far as I know, were under investigation. However, right after we published our paper, Kevin Mitnick um, published a book about his life on the lamb, and he was describing not doing a protocol level attack, because P25 didn't exist when he was on the lamb, but uh, he described listening, getting a little uh, walkie-talkie and listening to the FBI, which was using a predecessor encrypted uh, encryption system, and any time they were encrypted, he would jam them just by brute force and force them to conclude that the encryption wasn't working this week, and they would go in the clear, and then he could figure out if it was him that they were looking for. Um, and actually, he used this very technique with much less energy efficiency than us, I should say. Um, so our, our scheme still has value, um, and, um, and we're, we're able to do this. Um, but we discovered there was no need to bother with any of that. Um, so um, uh, <clears throat> I had the privilege of learning, I don't know if this is classified, but uh, eh, who cares, um, NSA's uh, first rule of cryptanalysis, and it was told to me by Bob Morris, uh, who has passed away um, uh, recently in the 1990s, and it really stuck with me. Uh, he actually gave an invited talk where he revealed this at uh, Crypto 95, and he said, I'm going to tell you NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis. And everybody you could see kind of looked up and thought, okay, he's going to tell us something about, you know, uh, Gawa fields and, uh, um, and uh, matrices and, and stuff like that. And everybody was paying great attention to this, this revelation he would come up with. And he said, NSA's first rule of cryptanalysis, first look for clear text. Um, <laughs> and so we did that. Um, so we set up our own little SIGINT operation. and. Um, put in six different cities, um, basically spectrum capture stuff on all the federal bands to capture every P25 transmission we could find and just catalog how many on the frequencies that have encrypted stuff occasionally have non-encrypted stuff. And what we discovered was uh, it all, we, you know, in the case of every single sensitive federal agency, you see sensitive clear text. Uh, from every agency, and some of it horrifyingly sensitive, uh, from every agency except the postal inspector. Do not mess with the postal inspector. They know how to do their encryption, but pretty much nobody else does. Um, so we published our paper and, you know, and, and kind of uh, uh, gave up. So then I, I you know, basically said, okay, well, as a responsible academic, I should kind of talk to them and help them improve things. And uh, uh, that's kind of where we, uh, um, where this talk kind of picks up is what our experience was with that. The first thing I did was went to the standards body that came up with the protocol and uh, talked to them about the, uh, um, uh, you know, what some of the problems were. And they, what they explained to me very politely was that none of these were actually problems because I'm not an engineer and I don't understand decibels. Um, <laughs> And, um, uh, and then uh, they spent a long time insisting that I retract my paper. 
And you know, playing them sensitive clear text, uh, you know, didn't didn't actually um, help with that. So then I, I, you know, made friends with a lot of the radio people at different federal agencies, and uh, you know, they all they were all like, "Oh my God, this is actually a, a, a real problem." Um, you know, there's some genuinely really smart people who keep these systems running, but the standards and the implementations are, you know, really working against them. And so what we discovered was that, of course, I still had my little SIGINT operation going, so I'm keeping track of how well they're doing. I would explain this, and immediately things would go dark for us in whatever city, uh, you know, in whatever agency I would talk to uh, for about three weeks. And then it would get worse than it was before. Um, and um, what, as far as I can tell, was happening was that the message would go out, pay really close attention to your radios. And uh, people, and here's what you support supposed to do, you know, here's what the encryption symbol looks like and here's what you should do. And people would remember the details for about three weeks and only remember that they were supposed to pay special attention to the radio after that. Um, and um, it would start to go back to the clear, often worse than it was before because people are fiddling with the switch more often. Um, the protocol has the property that an encrypted user can happily in interact with a non-encrypted user if they both have key material. Um, so you can have that one guy who invariably is the one who says, okay, everyone, here's the plan. Um, uh, Maybe in, uh, encrypt in the clear when everybody else that he's uh, talking to is encrypted. Um, so the, um, this, this was seven and a half years ago. Where are we now? So we, uh, I did a quick survey of the remaining um, receiving stations that, that we have up and running, and we are getting almost to the minute the same amount of sensitive clear text um, that we were uh, seven and a half years ago before we actually told anybody that uh, we were up to this. So the sort of institutional uh, antibodies that prevent any change are really operating in full force and kind of all I can, uh, all I can say is it's been a great test of my willpower not to go to a life of crime. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, as far as anybody here is concerned, I haven't. Um, so, um, uh, anyway, if you're interested, let me suggest three things to read. Uh, least would be our paper, uh, which was called Why Special Agent Johnny Can't Encrypt. But um, Alma Witten's Why, uh, Why Johnny Can't Encrypt is an absolute required reading, I think, for anybody who gets anywhere near cryptography and implementations. And uh, Ross Anderson's 1993, Why Crypto Systems Fail. Uh, again, we are not taking anywhere near the lessons that we should out of, out of these uh, really important uh, pieces of work. So thanks very much. And uh, I'll, uh, I don't know if we do questions in this or what, but uh, one question. OK, make it good. Okay, well, thanks for, oh, well, somebody's hands is, is up. Great, hi. Oh, God. So here's the thing. Um, uh, so he, there's a rule, section 705 of the Communications Act of 1934, which basically says, no, you can't do that. However, on the, even on the FCC's website, uh, which probably is down right now because of the shutdown, uh, even on the FCC's <laughs> website, it, it actually says, we don't believe, and there's a Supreme Court case that basically addressed this, we don't believe this law is constitutional. Um, so, you know, don't really worry about it unless you're in a privileged position where you weren't, you know, where you were uh, receiving the audio in a position of trust. But uh, it, it appears to just be legal to tell anybody um, uh, anything that you've heard, except there's also still, there are still really serious, much worse laws that apply to almost everyone in the country against obstruction of justice. Um, and we're, you know, there's a matter of controversy about whether it applies to actually everybody, but it definitely applies to me. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it definitely applies to me. So, you know, audio of like sensitive law enforcement in, uh, investigations that could actually blow a case is a really bad idea to, to publish. You know, at some point, I've got a greatest hits album that I should probably put up, <laughs> but uh, it's still too soon for that, I'm afraid. All right. Okay, so thanks everyone. <laughs>